Um, we're going to get started in just a few moments with a, a sort of a news update. And then Professor Scott Cardell from Palomar College is going to talk to us about observing with smart telescopes. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please feel free to put any questions you might have into the chat uh, over on Facebook, and I'll be checking it for you. And then if there's any questions that we can answer, we'll be happy to do so. And if you're not watching this live, still feel free to ask questions, and I'll be monitoring the feed, and I'll answer them for you as I can. So. Um, before we get started, I wanted to mention we're working on setting up a date with a speaker for a November version of Astronomy on Tap so that we can meet back here on Facebook. So keep an eye out on our feed uh, so that you can stay up to date with uh, Astronomy on Tap San Diego, and we hope to be back in the breweries with you soon. So let's talk about some stuff that's been going on in astronomy news. All right, I did want to mention that there is a lunar eclipse coming up in November. Um, actually, it'll be the night of November 8th. Uh, actually, I should say the morning. It's basically starts the maximum, or I should say the total lunar eclipse starts around 1 a.m. in the morning on November 8th and ends at around 5 a.m. with maximum eclipse at about 3 a.m. And lunar eclipses turn this beautiful sort of orangish reddish color up in the sky as the moon passes passes into the shadow of the earth and the um, the reddish light you see is due to the color of all the sunrises and sunsets on earth uh, filtering through the atmosphere and falling onto the moon. Um, there had been a lunar eclipse uh, technically visible from San Diego in May, but I don't know about you, but I got clouded out. So I'm kind of hoping, <laughs> so I'm kind of hoping we will have better uh, weather for this one. Um, this is a beautiful image of a lunar eclipse taken by Mary Anderson, I believe back in 2014. And I love this one because it's so established establishes that we saw this lunar eclipse in San Diego. Oh, and then Europa, um, the Juno spacecraft, NASA's Juno spacecraft, which has been in orbit around uh, Jupiter and studying the planet Jupiter, did a close flyby of one of Jupiter's most interesting moons. This is the moon Europa and got closer to it than we've been since oh, the Galileo spacecraft in uh, the year 2000, I believe, just a couple hundred kilometers from the surface. What makes Europa a particularly interesting world is that it has has a surface almost completely, basically a water ice surface. Um, and it there's evidence that there is a deep liquid water ocean underneath the surface. And so uh, images of it are always amazing because this is a world with very little atmosphere to no atmosphere. So you'd expect it to be uh, pitted with craters all over it. And the fact that we don't see that and that we see sort of evidence of uh, fresh water coming in and filling in the cracks that you see here makes Europa an incredibly intriguing world. In fact, there have been recent observations that there might even be water geysers. Uh, activity on Europa as well. Um, Juno's uh, camera here um, is actually an education and public outreach camera. Uh, Juno, the spacecraft, could meet all of its science objectives without ever uh, needing a camera, but uh, they decided to put one in, uh, thankfully, from Mayland Space Science Systems here in San Diego County. And so a little bit of San Diego uh, given us this beautiful image of Europa. And the next uh, mission out to Europa, the Europa Clipper, is set to launch in 2024. So hopefully that'll get off the ground and get us more information about Europa soon. Okay, we hit an asteroid this week and I had a little bit too much fun. So we have two asteroids in this image. We have the big one, which is Didymos, and then the smaller one, Dimorphos, which is actually a moon around the bigger one. So we took the DART spacecraft and we kind of aimed it at the smaller one um, and hit it. And you might be wondering, why did we decide to do that? Well, um, the name DART means double asteroid redirection test. Look, it's rocks on the surface of an asteroid. Um, and it's, uh, this is an attempt, oh, this was the last image as it was crashing, by the way. Um, so um, this is going to loop over again because I could watch this forever. The idea is, is that um, if we ever saw an asteroid coming our way, um, the best chance for us to avoid getting hit is if we could nudge it 
just a little to get it uh, to avoid hitting the Earth. And so this is our first attempt at nudging an asteroid, a small one, all right, not a huge one. Um, and what's really interesting about this, okay, we're gonna we're gonna let it hit, and then I'll show you a, a few more images. All right, is that we could even see this is some imaging from a um, a program here on the Earth, which is monitoring uh, asteroids that come near the Earth, and you can see the debris cloud that got kicked kicked up. And in fact, uh, this tiny little asteroid now is kind of acting like a comet. It has a debris tail uh, behind it. And then we even observed this impact with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and, uh, and the uh, JWST telescope. So we're looking at it in um, sort of visible light and infrared light here to see the impact. Uh, hopefully over the next few weeks and months, we will find out if we were successful in redirecting the orbit of that asteroid as our first test to defend humanity against the asteroids that might come our way. And so that's just some stuff going on in astronomy news. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Scott Cardell from Palomar College, who is going to talk to us about observing with smart telescopes. I'm going to stop sharing and let Scott take over. Welcome. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, boy, that's a hard act to follow, um, things crashing into asteroids. Um, yeah, so let me see if I can get my actual screen to properly share. Okay, back to the astronomy on tap. All looking uh, good here. The logo there. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about smart telescopes. And maybe you're familiar with telescopes. Here's a picture of me with my, my go-to telescope. Well, not go-to, it's in the sense of electric electronic go-to, but my trusty Dobsonian telescope, which I've had for a very long time. Uh, it's an old school, no electronic sort of telescope, which I've used for many years. And, you know, during the pandemic, I started hearing about smart telescopes and seeing what they can do. And I started thinking about, well, what it is that I use my telescope for and, and and uh, let me show you how they're different from a traditional telescope. So maybe everyone's familiar with the fact that uh, at least in a reflecting telescope like the one I just saw showed, uh, light comes in, it hits a mirror, bounces to another mirror, and then it goes to an eyepiece where you would go and, and look through. And um, invariably when people start using telescopes, they kind of, um, want to see more stuff. And part of that is learning to know the sky a bit better. But some things out there are just plain faint and, and hard to see. And um, one way to sort of uh, improve that is to, well, have a bigger telescope. But even with a bigger telescope, you're kind of limited because our eye only collects light for a fraction of a second before it sends that signal on to your brain. And so one thing an eye can't do, which a camera can do, is accumulate light. Now, uh, it would be really cool if we could take a long exposure with our eye looking at something while uh, looking at something faint through the eyepiece of a telescope, but we just can't do that. So many people in amateur astronomy have decided to go into um, doing photography and that's a worthy thing. And there are people that, that get amazingly fantastic results. And I am totally, I would say not one of them. I'm not one of those people that have decided to go the route that like you see here where there's a lot of complicated gear and wires and, and, um, and stuff with a, with a setup that takes actually quite a while to, to piece together and align and, and, um, and I'm not dissing the people that do this because they do amazingly good things, but I've realized this is not the kind of setup that, that I need. Um, so that's why during the pandemic, I started to look into smart telescopes. And for me, I would say that smart telescopes are kind of like the way smart phones are in the sense of when the first smartphones were uh, announced and introduced, uh, they really were a big change. I mean, they've changed uh, not just phones, but I would say our culture in a lot of ways. I don't know that smart telescopes will change our culture, 
Um, but I think there have the potential to, to very definitely change how a lot of people do astronomy. So let me tell you what's up with that. First of all, I'm gonna show you a couple that are out there. This is one called the Vespera, which I considered. Uh, there's a newer version called the Stellina. Um, the, the number you see here is the size of the opening in the front. And I kind of gravitated towards the Unistellar Telescope, which has an opening in a, in a mirror in the back that's four and a half inches across, which is still kind of a small telescope. Um, I like the fact that it was a very traditional looking telescope, which I would say these two really aren't. Um, there's an option where you can use an eyepiece, which I'll, I'll mention, um, but it, they all do some, some really cool stuff. Uh, one of the things I like is they're super portable and um, you can't tell, but my telescope is in the backpack there in that shot. And so is the tripod. So like everything is right there. It's easy to take them someplace. And um, they're super easy to set up. Now I have a very tiny um, backyard with an amazing array of trees that really blocks the entire Western part of the sky for me. And I can see a fair amount of the sky, but usually from certain places. So I kind of at times during the night need to pick up my telescope, walk it to another spot and then look at a different part of the sky. And the nice thing about the smart telescope is the realignment takes a few moments and then you're off and running again. Um, that's not the case with a more sophisticated rig of all of the kinds of things that I showed you a little bit earlier. Uh, it takes a lot, a, kind of a longer time for alignment. Um, another thing that I really liked about the Unitel Unistellar telescopes in particular was the ability to do science observations uh, with the telescope. Um, they're partnered with the SETI Institute and they routinely have amateur astronomers that go out and observe asteroid occultations, which is where an asteroid passes in front of a star. And you can use that to determine the size of the asteroid. Um, there are people that observe exoplanets transiting in front of their star, literally to, to measure a planet in another solar system. We look at nearby asteroids, uh, comets, and even uh, novae and supernovae have been part of what's going on. I wanted to show you, um, here's something I shot earlier this year. So there's this little streak of a line that you see moving through there was an asteroid that passed near the Earth. It's got a catalog number for a name, um, but I took a series of exposures and uh, long enough to, for the asteroid to trail out into a line like that and then animated them together to show that. And this was all basically done from my couch. You know, the telescope's in the backyard. I'm sitting inside uh, where the air conditioning was going or, you know, just uh, also like looking at uh, a magazine or a book or something like that. Um, and yet I was able to do science observations with this and myself, along with a group of others, um, were able to send this information to Unistellar, which determined the rotational period of the asteroid. And I'm a co-author for a paper for literally putting my telescope in the backyard and sitting on my couch. Um, kind of a, a cool deal that that kind of thing can happen. Uh, there've actually been some other ones too. So this was sent off to the Minor Planet Center, but um, I actually, I'm co-author on three papers using my backyard telescope this year. And I didn't have to do any of the actual hard work to process the data. So it kind of feels like cheating, um, but it's also rewarding too. Um, I mentioned that people can observe uh, exoplanet transits. Um, last year, there were 92 different detections that people had using this four and a half inch telescope uh, to look at exoplanet transits. Um, again, that's where a planet passes in front of its star. This is an example of what some of the data looks like. Um, to me, it's just astonishing that, that a little telescope like that can observe uh, a planet passing in front of another star. It's kind of amazing the times we live in. Now, of course, one of the motivations for me was to take pretty pictures. Uh, these are some pictures I shot with my telescope uh, last year. You can see it's a variety of things, some solar system stuff. There was a lunar eclipse and uh, some nebulae, some galaxies. And we've had um, a little bit of some clouds here today, but I thought we could try to go and take a live look at some stuff now.
So what I want to do is, is end my PowerPoint. I'm just going to make that go away. And now you're all looking at my desktop, which is really not what I want you to see. So I'm going to stop my share for just a second. And now let's share the right thing. OK. So um, this is a live view of the moon from my backyard. And what I'm going to do right now is tell the telescope to change some of its, oh, some of its settings. That's maybe a slightly more pleasing view of um, the moon that we have right now. I can adjust the position of the telescope. This is being controlled, by the way, with an iPad um, that's plugged into the laptop. And we can get uh, zoomed in, if you like, a little bit. Nice view of the moon. Now, I'll tell you that the, um, the color is a little off. The sensor for this camera that they use is um, much more sensitive to infrared light than our eye is. And some of that comes in as kind of uh, red. It can make the moon look sort of brownish, uh, much, much different than um, the way it looks to your eye. But um, here's just a, a live view of the moon. You can see the uh, crater Tycho down there. And um, let me move up a little bit. Some of the Maria on the moon. So what I want to try to do, though, is to have us see if we can go to another target. Now, I mentioned there's been clouds, and I'm indoors, so I can't get a good sense of where the clouds are right now exactly. But I want to just at least show you how this works in terms of um, of where we're going. So there is a, a database in um, the telescope, and you can simply like choose a thing. Um, I usually just type in what I want to see, and so I want to go to see if we can see the Eagle Nebula, um, which is a nice cloud of gas that's in the process of forming stars. There's a famous Hubble Space Telescope picture that shows a portion of that, uh, the pillars of creation, it's often called. Um, and you'll see occasionally like stars sort of whizzing by. This is because the telescope is actively moving from where we were pointed at the moon towards uh, where we're headed for the nebula. Now, one of the things that's nice in the database is if you don't know anything about this, it kill, will tell you some things of, like how far away it is from Earth and that it's an open star cluster surrounded by an emission nebula. Um, and there's all kinds of information in there too. So if you don't know anything about what a star cluster is or what a nebula is or something like that, all of that info is there for you. It's actually, I think, very close to where we want to be, but it's still getting things centered up a bit and I see stars, so that's encouraging. Uh, it's much better than clouds. And um, so let's just let that final bit of pointing finish up. So there, it tells us that the go-to is finished. And what you see is nothing that looks amazingly awesome. But uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to this little thing that shows some stars right there and click on that. So what's happening here is the telescope is now taking a four second exposure and then another four second exposure and then another, and it starts stacking them in real time. So we're accumulating light four seconds at a time. So you can see right now, it actually says that it's up to eight seconds. Um, and we're just starting to see something. It's kind of grainy, doesn't look especially awesome at the moment. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, adjust some things like the background to make it a little darker. That'll help if there's some clouds in the area, but I'm gonna boost the brightness just a little bit too. Basically, I'm sort of adjusting the contrast. And you can see, so we're 28 seconds in that we're already starting to get some nebula here and that maybe I boosted the brightness too much because it looks a little funky. We'll give it some more time. So we're almost a minute in, 
And the star cluster here is showing very nicely, but we're, if I zoom there by pinching on the iPad, um, we're already starting to see this, this famous darker structure in here, which is the pillars of creation part that was photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and I would argue that for a four and a half inch telescope that hasn't even been looking at a thing for two minutes, um, this is a fairly impressive kind of thing. It's, it's impressive enough that um, at live events, a star party or um, any kind of outreach event that you might do with students or, or the general public, to be able to show people um, color in real time um, is kind of an impressive thing because most of us, uh, when we look through telescopes, don't have a whole heck of a lot of opportunity to see color except for some of the brighter stars uh, and uh, sort of like the, the tans and the browns of Jupiter and Saturn and, and things like that. And here we are just two minutes in and it's recognizably um, the kind of thing that, uh, that it represents, this nice emission nebula, this glowing cloud of hydrogen gas giving us that red light and the star cluster associated with it. Um, I should mention that if there are questions along the way, people can, you, you can interject at any time, uh, and I'll take that. I think rather than have us just sit on the Eagle Nebula, though, I'm going to point us to another object. All right, but I got to so, break in and say how amazing that was to see the Eagle Nebula pop up that quickly, especially yeah, with that I, color. That's stunning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. And so if you like color, let's, let's do something else with some color, too. Um, what I want to do is look at another object from the Messier catalog. And this is M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. So um, the telescope is just finishing up. It's saving, and then it's going to start slewing to the Dumbbell. Now, the Dumbbell's actually kind of pretty high in the sky right now. And um, this type of telescope has a mount that's called a, an altitude azimuth mount. And that makes it a little trickier um, for tracking things that are high in the sky, um, but it should work. And I don't know that it actually started to go to. It helps if I actually hit go to then. I think I, it's also possible, I think I have confounded the telescope. Let me, uh, let me just check and see how we're doing here. Oh, did I lose connection to the telescope? If so, that's, that's unfortunate. Okay, that looks better. So let's try this one more time. Okay. We're officially going off to uh, Messier 27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Now, the nebula we just looked at is a big cloud where stars are forming. What we're about to see, hopefully, uh, is a cloud of gas that's being given off by a single star, probably, uh, um, that's dying. And so um, this is a thing that's definitely closer to us. It is um, what is often referred to as a planetary nebula. And it's a name that's kind of unfortunate in astronomy because it doesn't really have anything to do with planets, uh, much to the chagrin of astronomy students everywhere. Um, but um, that's, that's what they're called. So they don't really have anything to do with planets, but it rather represents um, gas being given off by a star that's in the process of dying. And we're actually pointed at it now. It's that fuzzy area that's just moved to the right of center, uh, right in there. That's the nebula. Um, it's still going to hopefully put it back here to the center in, in just a moment, and then I'll start the time exposure. Um, now, one thing I want to mention that's not a feature of the telescope is something that whenever I connect through the way I'm connecting now, it always tells me the time is 9.41 a.m. on Tuesday, January 9th. And <laughs> don't think the telescope thinks that. Um, so what I am going to do, though, is start these four seconds exposures going again so that we can begin to see the Dumbbell Nebula. And um, this is a, another example of where we can get some really nice color really quickly um, 
of, of, a, of, a, of a nebula out in space. And this one's sometimes called the Apple Core Nebula, which I think is a name that people probably relate to better than the word dumbbell. Um, and I'm also going to just, again, bring down the background brightness a little bit, um, makes the sky a little blacker and helps the nebula to pop. Hey, so I definitely just lost connection there. And the telescope does not seem to know where it's pointing. So I'll show you that instead. So one of the things, unfortunately, um, I'm not quite sure what happened there. We're really close on the nebula, but it seems to have uh, had a bit of a hiccup there. And let's see if I can just slowly center it over because it was nearby. I think we're there. Let's just, let's just see how we're doing now. It never does this, except when there are people watching, <laughs> apparently. I, uh, I was still stunned once again to see how quickly this is showing up. Look at this. Right. Eight seconds. And it, of course, is very grainy right now. There's not a whole lot of signal there. But as we go a little further in, that noise starts to to go away and um, we get a pretty nice view of the sky and the nebula. Yeah, and in the middle there is the, the central star, the star that's in the process of, of giving this gas out into space. And um, yeah, just a few seconds in and um, it really captures the essence of what uh, a, a sort of a, a traditional photograph of a nebula like this would look like and gives people a chance to, to have an experience to see it in a way that um, most people haven't done before. Um, also, what's, what's nice about this is you can have people download the app and if you're like observing with them, they can use their phone and they can get the pictures like right away on their phone. Um, and if you're daring, you can let other people try to operate the telescope. Um, I, I've done a little bit of that with some of my students uh, just this fall, giving them a, a taste of trying to use the telescope. Hope to do some more of that too. So we're not even two minutes in. I think we've already got a, a recognizable shot of what looks like this bubble of gas that's being ejected from uh, this dying star and um, works pretty well. Now I will tell you that this is a, a wide angle telescope. And so it's not really optimized for things like the planets. We can see the planets. Um, and if you want, we could slew over to Saturn real quick. And I'll show you that Saturn looks very tiny, but it is something we can see and we would be able to see the rings of Saturn too. So I think now that we've hit two minutes, I'll just go ahead and stop that. We'll give Saturn a try and, and uh, see how we're doing from there. And then while we're slewing to Saturn, I just want to remind people over on Facebook that if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll make sure Professor Cardell gets them. And for those that don't know, um, Jupiter and Saturn are both nicely placed in the evening sky right now. Um, Jupiter is the brightest thing in the night sky other than the moon right now. Um, and Saturn is not amazingly far from the moon tonight. So if you get a chance to step outside and it's clear um, tonight um, and you look towards the moon, kind of the brightest thing you see just sort of vaguely in the area of the moon is uh, Saturn, a worthy thing to try to go look at. Just to be able to spot it with your eyes is a fun thing to do. So we're still on our way over to Saturn, and hopefully it's nice and clear there. Again, I have no idea. Ah, I believe it is. So um, it is in the field of view, and it looks at the moment very terrible. Uh, Saturn kind of overexposed, and um, yet there are some satellites of Saturn, some of its moons that are, are visible in the image too. Um, didn't quite give it centered here, so let's just... Uh, 
center it up. Oops, maybe too far. And you can tell that the rings are there, but if I do the old pinch and zoom uh, thing that we're all used to doing with on our phones and tablets, you get a little bit better view of the rings. And you also notice that it's kind of wobbly, sort of shaky, and that's, that's not the telescope, that's not Saturn, that's Earth's atmosphere. And we have to look through the atmosphere and it's turbulent and it makes the light move around too. We do have a relevant question as you're zooming okay. in on Saturn. Um, there's a question about, are there bigger smart scopes than yours? So basically, are there any scaled up like eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch sort of uh, unistellar telescopes? Um, unistellar does not go any bigger currently than the, the four and a half inch. There is um, a, um, something from the same company that does the, the Vespra that's coming out that's a bigger telescope that has a, um, a really high price that I don't remember right now. Uh, and I was just both astonished at, at what they were planning to build and how much it was going to cost. Um, one of the things about that particular telescope, and I don't know that I remember the name, but I'll drop the name of it into the chat or the comments on the video when it gets posted later. Um, is that the computer chip that's sensitive to light in that telescope, they're gonna make that upgradable. So one of the things that's not true for these other smart telescopes is that when cameras get better, you have the camera you have. Um, and that telescope, they're going to make it so that you've got your optics, but they're going to be able to upgrade the camera for that too. Um, and it was um, kind of a lot as I, as I recall. Yeah, I mean, most of these are not cheap. The unistellar telescopes are a few thousand dollars, but this was enough to make me um, be kind of astonished at, at how much it was going to be. Um, I'll do one other thing here with Saturn, if it'll let me. Sometimes on planets, it doesn't want to, but if we go back to doing this um, accumulated light, which is not been going for 284 minutes, um, sometimes we can um, pull in more light and, and begin to see some of the moons. Um, I think on Saturn, it doesn't want me to do that. Oh, there we go. So in the view here now, this would almost certainly be Saturn's moon Titan. And this would almost certainly be three other moons. And I haven't checked to see which is which tonight. Um, it's possible there might be another right right near Saturn, right there. Um, and so that's one of the things that I kind of like to explore too, is not just seeing a, a little dinky picture of Saturn and its rings, but to be able to look at the, the planetary moons that are there as well. So in the chat, somebody said uh, a $30,000 Hyperia. Does that ring a bell? That's it. Yes. Yes. $30,000. $30,000. Yeah. Um, do you remember how big that was supposed to be? I mean, the upgradable chip sounds fantastic, but. Yeah, um, no, I don't because I last looked at it um, many months ago and I, I don't remember the size of it, but that's exactly it, um, the Hyperia. Um, yeah, um, well, I would the, say the college the, pays me nicely, but not that nicely. Not that nicely. Oh, somebody dropped 16 inches diameter in the chat. That would be amazing though <laughs> yeah yeah um you know that the for me the the downside is you'd almost have to have it permanently mounted um because i think there's an equation for using personal telescopes and one of the factors in that is how much does it weigh and how heavy is it to to set up and one of the things i like about the telescope at this size is the fact that it's, I can carry it with no problem at all. I can move it around and set it up very easily. And the larger a telescope gets, the more um, complicated that is. If it starts being part of the equation of like, do I want to carry that outside or not? You're probably not going to use it. And um, there's sort of an old adage that your best telescope is the one you use most often. Like you can, um, if you just want to go out and, and do stuff, that's probably your go-to telescope. 
uh, is the one that you're, I mean, your go-to telescope is the one that you drag outside and you may have better telescopes that are more work, but if you're not using them, um, they're probably not better in that sense. Well, I don't know if we have time for another quick thing or not, or how we're doing. Um, if so, uh, if you feel up to it, I'm up for looking at, at least one more thing as I monitor the chat for questions. And then, yeah, as was said in the chat, the peer of having it on a peer would definitely be mandatory for a 16 inch. And I totally agree with you yeah, that the yeah. best telescope is the one that you use. Let's see if we can, yeah, I think this is high enough in the sky. I'm going to try for M15 in Pegasus. Should have a good view there. It's a globular star cluster. Of course, if anyone wants to send in donations for Lisa and I to be able to get one of these 16 inch telescopes, uh, I'm sure we would be willing to receive those or even our respective colleges probably. <laughs> While we're slowing, I'll do a little bit of advertising. We're happy that the uh, Palomar College Planetarium is back open and, and on uh, Friday nights, if you wanna come and check out a show, um, please come see us. Um, we were closed for a very long time for COVID, and then we were closed um, because of uh, technical issues that struck us when everything was turned down. So as you can see, we're pointed right here at the globular star cluster. I'm going to go ahead and have it start working on um, doing those timed exposures to give us a better view of the cluster here. So this is um, M15, and all of the things I've been showing you tonight, except for the Moon and Saturn, are from the catalog of things that aren't comets uh, that was uh, compiled by Charles Messier. And so the M for M15 or M27 um, uh, stands for um, Messier in his last name. So we're just a few seconds in, and you can see that we have a nice star cluster. Um, Earlier, when we looked at the Eagle Nebula, we saw what was called an open star cluster with it, which is sort of a smattering of stars. Here, the stars are much more densely packed together, and clusters like this typically have a few hundred thousand stars, sort of a globe of stars, which is where that name globular cluster uh, comes from. In fact, it's already, I would say, um, overexposed and saturated at the, the core of the cluster. I could probably change um, some of that because we have the ability to change brightness and background to do some optimizing of the image. Now, every so often you'll see that it looks like the whole thing kind of shifts a little bit. And that's when a, a new image comes in in the telescope, which has been moving and the sky has been rotating on its field of view when it's the software there is like stacking in the new, the new image. Anyway, this is just sort of a, Hopefully interesting look at, um, I think what's, what's coming in terms of the future. I think smart telescopes are going to be more and more common. It's not necessarily just Unistellar or, or the other company I mentioned, um, but I would expect more and more of these in our future. And I hope something that it will be interesting enough that uh, it inspires a few more young people to be interested in astronomy and um, looking at the universe. Well, awesome. Thank you. Um, while I wait sure. to see if there's any more questions in the chat, I have a question. Sure. Um, what was the learning curve like for getting used to using your smart telescope? So I would say that other than the first night when I did something really stupid, um, it, it went really well. Um, the dust cap is also a Batonoff mask, which is used for focusing. And I accidentally took off the dust cap part, but left the focusing part and couldn't figure out why I couldn't see any stars. Like I was very confused. And there's a little thing where you do orientation and it points to stars, but it doesn't work when it can't see any stars. Um, but I'll tell you, once I finished beating my head against the wall that night and realized that I didn't take the, the cap off properly, I was able to take pictures of stuff like right away. Um, and that was 
really uh, pleasing to me. I'm not one of those people that's like heavily into image processing and and um, doing these other kinds of things. But for me to be able to see things that very first night that I had never seen before, like uh, M76 is, a, is a, another object from the Messier catalog. I'd never seen it. I don't think I would ever in a telescope was like, oh, that's out, let me look at that. And to see color and um, to, to catch it the first night was, was great. I, I, I think the, the early part is learning to focus your telescope, learning to see if you need to maybe collimate the telescope. Um, some people get very advanced with image processing or using a, a, some filters and you can use filters with the telescope. Um, I like to look at things that move. So I'll do a lot of things for like that asteroid I showed you earlier or pictures of Pluto from one night to the next, that kind of thing. That's, that's a little fun to do, but um, I've seen more things with this than I have with any other telescope before. Um, asteroids and various galaxies and, and things like that. And for me personally, that's been lots of fun. And it's also been in some cases, things that I can also share with my students, which is, is helpful in that way too. Like I showed the discovery uh, images of Pluto earlier this semester, but then I showed pictures I took in August, you know, the same, same kind of thing. Um, and um, I don't know, for me, it's making astronomy more fun again. Of course, it's always been fun for me. I, I'm an astronomy professor, professor but um, again, it's given me a new perspective on the universe and it, it didn't really take me a whole heck of a lot of time to get going. And because there are other users out there online uh, there's some Facebook groups devoted to these types of telescopes. It's easy to find someone to go, uh, I don't know how to do this thing. And, and everybody's quick to, to volunteer and answer, which is always nice. That's awesome. Um, there's some thank yous for your uh, presentation in the chat. Uh, there was also a question about, uh, is it possible to put a smart telescope up on a cabin on Palomar Mountain or something, but then run it via the internet uh, from you know, San Diego. So I guess another way of asking that is what, what's the connection? How does that work? So um, what the telescope does is it generates a Wi-Fi network that, that you then connect to with a, a phone or a tablet, um, but you still need to have a way to take off the cover, which I would not leave off. Um, the focus is physically turning a big wheel at the back. So that's not an automated thing. Maybe someday that'll, that'll be different. So I don't think anyone has been using these as remotely operated telescopes yet. And I think if you're gonna get serious about remotely operated telescopes, you're probably gonna go with a bigger one than, than this anyway. Um, so I, I don't think that's a thing yet. Um, maybe someday down the line. Well, thank you. Um, I think I caught all the questions in the chat and yeah, the idea of remote operating one of these, this is like, you know, having a bigger one, maybe that's part of that $30,000 one. It's kind of like, <laughs> you know, so. doing observing from Kit Peak or something in your home. Uh, but anyway, this has been great. Uh, I know that uh, it's easy to get a little jaded sometimes or used to seeing the pretty pictures, but there is something about seeing space live through a telescope. So thank you so much for sharing that mm -hmm. with us this evening. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. And then um, I'm going to um, just say, hey, everyone, thank you for showing up. Thanks for participating in the in the chat. And uh uh, subscribe to Astronomy on Tap San Diego, either on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, so that you can know when we're going to do our next thing, which is hopefully in November, once I can pin down a date from the person who's agreed to do the talk. Uh, so watch our feed and we'll see you again soon. Thanks again, Scott. Hope to see you soon too. Yeah. All right. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone.